Hello, man. Look at him. It's the Two Chumps Football Podcast. Chad Wilson, Emil Calamino, dressed like an executive for the Dallas Cowboys today. I guess that means he's happy with their draft. Whether you're <laughs> whether you're happy or not, we're getting into it today, and uh, we're going to talk all pretty much all draft. Ninety eight percent of this podcast is going to be about the draft. This is uh, this is. Your first time joining us and you haven't had a chance to do it yet, go ahead and subscribe to the show. Whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening on Apple, Spotify, podcasts, whatever you are using to stream your podcast, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You will not be disappointed. All right, let's jump right into it, Emil, because uh, we just, we need to, we need to get to the meat and potatoes. The NFL draft last weekend, and I, you know, I did make this comment on Twitter, Emil, that there is nothing more hopeful and ambitious than a fan base before the season. There's nothing more negative than a fan base once the season starts. Um, and nothing more revising than the NFL draft. If you were, if you like to have some fun with the draft, because now I'm really for entertainment because you get it. You just start age, you realize nobody knows what's really going on. No. Mm-hmm. How, did you see any of the shots of some fans, you know, they would do the close-ups on the fans sitting there listening for the name that's going to be called out, and they call out some obscure tackle or whatever, and they're like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, man, you, you got know the, average, you know the average NFL fan, right, is not, like, journaling this stuff. Well, it would be fun. I said, you got some months from the time they were third, and said, listen, every time there was was a draft, I went for the journal. Just turn on they, who they or just film your reaction to it, and go back four years later, right? And he said to the, you know, say, "Oh, I'm thrilled that we got Abel Calamino, the left tackle from Penn State." <laughs> and then you realize that I never played a down. You know, listen, those lineman picks in the first round end up really being the ones. But I, right, Abel, I got to jump into this thing. I've got a rant. I want people in the media and people on Twitter to shut the hell up about what the Atlanta Falcons did, okay? For everyone else, when a team goes out and gets their guy at quarterback, no one has a problem. But the Atlanta Falcons go out and do that, and people are all upset. Why? Why is it a bad pick? Because of Kirk Cousins all of a sudden? For weeks, you were killing Kirk Cousins because he's only got he's, – he's made all this money in the NFL. He's the richest quarterback ever in the NFL, but he only has – one playoff victory. Isn't that what you guys were saying? So, all right, you may not have been happy or satisfied or thought that's what Atlanta should have done at their quarterback position. Nevertheless, they did it. And I tend to feel that that was really more Arthur Blank than anyone else. He's kind of a guy that I need to see it now. He's 81 years old, for Christ's sake. So he just wants to see something happen. Now, why 81, might I add? I know. Well, I mean, good, but it's 81. You never know. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So. Um, he just, that's his, that's his bank account. That's his checkbook. He decided he wanted to give Kirk Cousins $180 million, a hundred million guaranteed. However, the front office and the coach thinks that Michael Penix is their guy. They like their guy. Pick number eight came up. Lo and behold, he's available. We're not going to be like, oh, well, we've got Kirk Cousins. We'll pass on that. Get the hell out of here. That's their guy. They had a chance. They freaking picked them. And I got to tell you, a black quarterback in Atlanta is a beautiful thing. We've seen oh, that. I mean, I mean, that's a winner. We know what Michael Vick, I mean, he was long. That's it. It's a black city. There yeah. are black people in the crowd, which is not really a whole lot of what you get in an NFL town or a given Sunday. No. And he's there. This makes up for Chick-fil-A being in the stadium and not being open on Sundays. You're going to have Michael <laughs> Penix in there. So listen, if Kirk Cousins – leg doesn't want to hold up at 35 because it's off of surgery you've got something that you can put in there and at least at the very least have the fans be excited about we don't know if michael Penix is going to light it up in this league but golly they got their guy amo and that's just how i see it they got their guy okay they didn't pick some other guy that maybe someone wanted that we have no idea it's 50 50 anyway i personally think dallas turner would have been a good pick but i'm biased the kid played for me for a little bit in high school we're all at the same youth league i know his parents so i i would be biased if i said that but nine listen most of the time and we've talked about this you have no idea what's going to happen with that first round pick but i know this apart from the system that's being run 
or anything else that's going on, black quarterback Atlanta is just really a great thing. No, right? I mean, hey, listen, it's as simple as that. This is a business. That's that's a business decision and nothing else. Now, I'll tell you, I gave you this stat last week, right? They went back to decade. Mm-hmm. So 320 or 32 first round picks, right? 76% over the last decade became full time NFL starters. Sure. So it's a, it's a coin flip. It is. A lot of people tell you, and I'm not, I, this is a very hard business. So it's not even a shot at a fun offense or it's hard to predict how guys are going to transition from college to the NFL. I mean, sure, some people are better at it than others. That's why they pay millions of dollars, but still, it's a coin flip. Some teams are just better with the whole development thing, and then it's it, like it makes it seem to people that they are they just pick better players. Mm-hmm. No, they know what to do with players when they get them. First, they pick guys that fit what it is that they do. Second, right. when they get into the building, they know how to go turn a college football player into an NFL football player. But Amol, that's my rant. There's a black head coach and a black quarterback potentially down the road. Yeah, you're, 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 and Hank Aaron broke the whole run record. You can't, you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't beat it. Yeah, you can't beat it. My but, rant, hey, you, what's your rant, my friend? Passionate is yours. Uh, you know, the Mel Capers of the world kind of annoy me because they'll spend an entire year leading up to the draft telling you how you're an idiot if you spend a high draft pick on a running guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the Cowboys call along. Fill their running back rules. And, you know, Dowell's already there last year. It was a good backup, by the way. Anybody who watched the Cowboys, he actually ran better than Paul. Okay. Uh, they had news on. They got him in the sixth round last year. They brought in some veterans. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, the Cowboys were idiots. They didn't draft a running back. Well, to me, there was only two backs in this draft that I thought were above the third round. And that was Brooks, who left to Carolina. At 46, 10 mm-hmm. picks before Dallas. And then. Not a Trey really rich running back draft, let's be honest. Now, and Trey Benson, who went seven picks later. So Dallas stayed true to more than yeah, traditionally very good drafting team. ESPN did a piece on it last year where they went through starters, Pro Bowls, all pros. And at the top of that list were the Ravens and Cowboys. The Cowboys win a lot of games. It's not like they're, they're like the Dan Marino Dolphins used. Yeah. You know, 12 wins. They're exciting. They're, they're in there. They're exciting. And then they let you down in the playoffs. But it's not for lack of talent. So I'm going to trust Will to play. Tyler knows what he's doing. He, he's done well in the draft. Now rebuild their offensive line with two, what I think can be two stud players. Next to another young stud, Tyler Smith, who was an all pro last year, second year player. Zach Martin is still an anchor. So run the ball straight ahead. I mean, you can get somebody to come along the ball at four or five yards. I mean, this isn't. I'm not. Yeah, looking and there's been talking people about people thinking, "Hey, listen, um, you know, Jerry Jones wants to know what he really has in Dak before we get into these big long-term contract discussions." It it really could be, but I still think that will come down. I, I think Jerry's problem is with that we're a whole different subject. He always wants the best deal, and he doesn't understand. This is, he's trying to hit a moving target. He's like a guy that won't buy a new cell phone because mm. he wants the best cell phone. Right. But every week, a new, better one comes up. Of course. So he's, he's trying to get a moving target. I think Dak's going to get extended because year has been through winter mm. between Trey and Tony Rollo. Cowboy fans out there, remember 2001 through 2000, first half of 2005, no Aikman, no Rollo. We had guys like Chad Hutchinson, Cliff Stoner, Anthony Wright, I think Quincy Carter. I mean, right. I can go on and on a Sunday afternoon as a Callaway fan. You knew you were going to lose. Well, uh, yeah, that's a that's an awful feeling if you're a fan. All right, next thing we need yeah. to switch to here is obviously what was the big talk going into the draft and what happened right when the draft started, and that was Caleb Williams going to the Chicago Bears at number one. I'm on record on this show as saying I – Look, Caleb Williams was obviously a top of the line quarterback in the in college football. I just had a hard time thinking that his game was going to translate over to the NFL just because everything seemed like a recess play. Like we talked about years ago mm-hmm. with Colin Kaepernick, there's just no continuity and scheduling to to the plays. All right, it's and that's where this game really still, even though we've have more mobile quarterbacks in the NFL, that's still the way that this game 
is one. The ball moves faster than your legs. So running around in there is not a good proposition. Either A, it's going to be difficult for you to get away from the NFL defensive linemen and linebackers that will pursue you, or B, you're eventually going to get yourself dunked on the ground and hurt. I know we see Patrick Mahomes doing it. I know he's getting away with it. We got to stop comparing everyone to Patrick Mahomes, all right? There was not another Dan Marino when he was playing. Um, you know, there's not another Tom Brady. Um, Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. I didn't. I personally don't think Caleb Williams' game is going to translate to the NFL. I didn't really care for the Chicago Bears being the team that picked him because he just doesn't doesn't really fit the city. The game doesn't fit the city. What he needs to do offensively doesn't fit what historically the Bears' identity has been. So I didn't love it. With that said, I do love what the Bears did for their first number one overall pick. They went out in the in the in the off season in anticipation that this is the guy that they were going to take, and they picked up they picked up some weapons for him. All right, they got Keenan Allen in the door. They have that there available for him. And then you go in the first round after him because you had a whole bunch of picks because you're the Chicago Bears. Yes. You pick up the guy he wanted from uh, Washington is within the same conference. Roma Dunze, he's happy about that. So Caleb Williams comes and in. They also had DJ Moore there. He had DJ Moore there. Obviously, he had done his thing there last year. It made them kind of they, look. They like brought that. in DeAndre Swift. You have DeAndre Swift. So he oh, has. It's been the so what they're doing is, it, This is where it's smart, right? We all know that everybody wants the young quarterback for several reasons. The base is salary cap, and you don't take that huge quarterback hit. And hope. Okay, Let's well, be honest. And hope. But they are setting up a process where they can also evaluate his second contract. Mm -hmm. A lot of these teams leave themselves in this limbo because they bring a guy in with nothing around with them. And then they're sitting there saying, well, is it that he's not that good or that he has no, like, in other words, the Giants did it with Daniel Jones. Right. There really wasn't a lot around Daniel Jones. They gave him that second contract. He's making over $40 million a year. And if I could give them the Soviet Pentecost through the zero, they just they didn't do it. Sure. It's, you know what I mean? Because, and yeah, the Giants had a high pick this year. They went out and tried to make, you know, one of the lemons and got a receiver, but I think they would have preferred to maybe take it like the pass. Or one yeah, it's late in the game, you know, like um, Daniel Jones' is, is confidence is probably shot. What I like about what the Bears did is, yep, you picked up a veteran wide receiver in the in the offseason through, uh, you know, free agency, whatever. He was cut. I don't remember what happened there with Keenan Allen. I believe he was released. And then you're also bringing in a guy in Odunze who's going to grow with Caleb Williams. So yeah. they come into the same class. Odunze gets to come in and learn from Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. And you also have a receiver that's going to go with you. Not a, not a high-priced free agent that comes in. He's played. He gets old, he leaves you, now you don't have a weapon, kind of stuff that happened with Cam Newton when, um, you know, he, he he came in. And the only weapon he really had at the time was Steve Smith. Steve Smith got a little older, he left, now I don't have anything. So they've done everything. What that sets up, Emil, is there are no excuses for Caleb Williams. And if they don't win more than seven games this year, they are going to be on his case, right, wrong, or indifferent. Can he handle that? I didn't see that when he was at USC. The, the key for him is obviously going to be teacher how to use his legs correctly. If you remember when he first burst out of the scene at Oklahoma in that Texas game when he came off the bench, I still remember saying, who the hell is this guy? Mm -hmm. I mean, he ran 65 yards straight down the field. Right. To me, it's like you got to teach him, number one, if, you, if you're moving in the pocket, be moving forward. Stepping mm -hmm. up in the pocket is always a problem for NFL defense. It's when a quarterback knows how to step up into the pocket in, in that little zone there that where he's, and throw the ball or step up in the pocket and run a la Kyler Murray. Don't do this stuff. When you go that and they don't fix that, yeah, no problem. And I almost feel like that stuff's innate. Like um, you, you either know that or you don't. I feel like Kyler Murray has displayed it, – with him, it seems like it's instinctive. He knows. I feel like with Patrick Mahomes, you see how he scrambles and gets those yards that annoys the defense? It's almost like – I don't feel like that can be taught. It's You you have that or you don't. And we're going to see if Caleb Williams has it. Maybe he adjusts his game knowing he could do what he did in college and knowing maybe he can't do that in the NFL. That's going to be interesting for us to see. Well, I got you. Know, someone who played a lot of baseball and golf – 
they stretch you to do, and I'm sure there are for quarterback coaches, drills that you can do to change a guy's swing. You know, if they're doing something where they're dealing with drop on the elbow, so there's different things you can do to work on it. So, I mean, I'm sure there's some quarterback who... Well, has, but yeah, that's a technique thing, not an instinct thing. You see what I'm saying? Well, right. So maybe I put a shock collar on a guy when he starts... Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> could you imagine if they did that and it worked? You'd be selling that. Poor kids all across the high schools. Oh, no. Across the country. You're, you're two yards outside the right tackles. <laughs> yeah, I could see high school kids that are quarterbacks all across the country coming home with their hair standing up in the air because they got By the way, people, because I'm a USC fan, I don't agree with you on this. I tend to agree with you. I, I want him to succeed as a fan. Um, I, I, I'm not, after seeing him for two years, He's an amazing athlete. I'm not sure it translates here or less learn how to harness it. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm at this point rooting for the kid just because of so much pre-draft hate that he got. But we're going to see. He's he's a little quirky, Emil. I'm not going to lie to you. So we'll yes, see how that fits up in Chicago. Pay your fingernails. Pay your fingernails, sir. But... All right, so I got to ask you this. What do you think was the best pick in in that first round? You go first on that, and then I'll offer up my opinion on this. The best pick of after buying talent, fit, and everything, I think, was Odunzi at number nine. Mm. But I think he could have easily, I think he's right there with Marvin Harrison. Personally, mm-hmm. that's the best receiver in the draft. I like the LSU kids too. It was, it was a good, good wide receiver draft. But I think getting him at nine with everything you just talked about makes hell of a lot of sense. Um, and I'm going to throw a bonus say like, I also liked Harrison at four to the Cardinals because I feel like he is the best receiver in the draft based on pedigree and, and what he actually did on tape. And I, I think the Cardinals already have a really good quarterback, an underrated quarterback. I talked about that. I, mm-hmm. I'm a big Kyle and Murray fan. So I think those two picks would be, you know, for, but I'm going nine. I like, I like, I love what means you where he fell and in, in the whole situation with the Bears. <laughs> A uh, number of picks that I liked, and I'll tell you then, you know, what I thought was a great one. I'm going to agree with you. Marvin Harrison, I think, is a great pick for the Arizona Cardinals. Not only is he the top receiver, you know, uh, in, in the in the draft, he's the right kind of receiver for Kyler Murray. Um, you know, Kyler Murray's not a six foot four quarterback, and a lot of times he's got to move around in that pocket to make that throw. Sometimes he's just throwing that ball out there. I have seen Kyler Murray play live more than I think I've seen any other quarterback ever play. And this goes in, into high school. So I'm familiar with his game like Kylo Murray was not a Kylo Murray fan when he was coming out, but having watched him in person over the last three seasons, I've become a fan of Kylo Murray and Marvin Harrison Jr. is the type of receiver that he needs. He needs that big target um, and that he could just throw a ball up to and a guy makes a play. On top of that, he's got the speed and Kyler Murray's got the arm. So I think that's a really good fit there. I like Dallas Turner going to Minnesota. Um, you know, let's let's upgrade the defense. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, already, I'm already on record with my biases there, but he's, um, he's a once-in-a-lifetime type pass rusher, all right? And that's what you're going to need. In that conference, you've got Caleb Williams now. You've got Jordan Love coming to 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 prominence in Green Bay, and you've got Jared Goff doing his thing. It'd be nice for Minnesota if you can pressure that quarterback, especially in your league. Um, I like Quinion Mitchell. I typically don't like cornerbacks going to Philadelphia, but what I like about this pick is a kid can do everything. And what has happened with cornerbacks when they've gone to Philadelphia outside of the Darius Slay is. They're, they're, they can do really only one thing, and then what the Eagles decide to do defensively doesn't jive with what that guy does. Quinion Mitchell can do a lot of things. He can play off. He can play zone. He can play press. He can do all these things. But So I think that's a good fit for them. No matter what the bipolar forces on Philadelphia's defense decide to do, he'll be a decent fit no matter what it is they like to do. Like uh, I like Barton. Uh, when you take a center – in that first round, no one loves it, but it ends up being good, like Tampa Bay doing that and supporting Baker Mayfield. However, my my what I think was the best pick in that first round was Jim Harbaugh coming in and establishing what I am, what this is going to be, and that is we are going to be physical 
and I love the trenches. So I go get the best left tackle that was available, Joe Alt from Notre Dame, who's a damn good football player. And what's his support for your quarterback? than getting him some protection. We tried the whole thing with a whole bunch of weapons running around everywhere, Keenan Allen, Michael Williams, and it didn't just really go that way. Yeah, I have a question for you. I have a serious question. And didn't they just draft the left tackle from the, from Northwestern to the year or two ago? They did. So you get a left and a right. However, they're going to do it. We're supported on the edges. We keep our guy up our right. If you feel like Justin Herbert and like you and everyone else, like we've talked about, everyone thinks he's great. Okay, cool. If he can stay upright, Maybe we lose a weapon, but he's so great, he's going to turn whatever is out there into weapons, and they still have some, all right? But I like Jim Harbaugh coming in and establishing this is who we're going to be. Day one, I'm telling you right now, yeah, people are saying should have taken a wide receiver. If you know Jim Harbaugh, who will sleep in a trailer, will wear Dockers, mm -hmm. shop at Kmart, He's not getting a receiver with that top pick. He went and um, stayed on, stayed on brand, got himself a lineman. Let's be sound up for I'm a red fan of a line, a lot had to line in the first round. If, if there's, if there's, because like I was saying, there's only so many big human beings that got me, right? Sure. And you know, there's a lot of normal size cast human beings who more than average, but big guys. So when you get somebody at six, five, six, six, can you show them and they're not, you know, like, bring it on. I mean, I, I want a lot of those guys around me. Right. No, I uh, I, I liked that pick the best. I, I was very happy with my team's pick at 29. The guy's 6'6", six 330 six, pounds. He's athletic. Uh, and I know they said I was only played 14 games, but th that's okay. The other stuff, the technique stuff you can work on. But yeah, maybe maybe less tread on the tires, whatever the case may be. All right, switching yeah. from the best pick in that first round, what did you find to be the most interesting? And you can't say Michael Penix. Uh, the most interesting pick for me was Kansas City. Kate and Xavier Worthy, at, I think, 28. Because, obviously, they noticed last year, and we talked about this on many shows, the pivot of Andy Reid. To realizing I can't be what I want to be, which is an offensive genius. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go more conservative. I've got the best quarterback. I'm going to take short throws, run the ball, play the white defense, one hit the Super Bowl last year. Right. That's how Randy wants to do it long term. No, I will say that was a good pivot by him, though. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was. It was. It's an underrated. It shows why he's a Hall of Fame coach. Um, but Dan Xavier Worthy shows we really miss Tyree Kill, even mm -hmm. if we don't want to admit it. He did something for us that allowed us to sling the ball over the place. It was fun. And I'm not saying Worthy is Tyree Kill. They're different builds. Uh, you know, Worthy's speed is more cop end. But I think he's looking for something that can take the, the top off of defense and reopen up the underneath where he can play some audience to start average. You know, yeah, I'm going to trust, trust Andy Reid on that. Yeah. Um, although, although he's not been able to make Kadarius Tony work in that offense. Um, and he had DeAndre, he had DeAnthony Thomas years ago. And that didn't work. I'm concerned that Worthy could fall First into that all, category. I admit that you had a bias towards Gary Thomas. Well, I saw a great player in person several times in college. It just has not happened there. I don't know if the Giants messed him up forever. I think the Giants messed him up. I'm I think they have. The Giants, not any. No, I'm here to tell you it does suck when that first place you go to in the yeah. NFL doesn't get it right, and it goes really, really bad. It's tough to get it back. Kudos, though, to to Andy Reid. He has kept Kadarius Tony around, despite many people saying he should be gone, and he's going to try to make that work. If Kadarius Tony could be University of Florida Kadarius Tony and Worthy can take the top off of the defenses, like you said, and you get a year or two left out of Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs are right back to being – hellacious on offense on top of what they well, I mean, you know, that, this is a whole summer show you know we have something historic it's two other teams or three have attacked it they're all for a free piece not to mention they did add hollywood brown in the off season too as well so yeah and it's also gonna be a big year for the chiefs the three teams we've never seen we've seen teams come close 49ers in 1990 cowboys in 94 but we've never seen somebody's complete cast so we're gonna see
I'm excited to see it. Look, I, I'd asked this, myself this question about the first round. What was the most interesting pick? And for some reason, Emil, I keep coming back to Brock Bowers being picked by the Oakland Raiders. If anyone has been eating in the NFL over the last few years, it's been tight ends. Tight ends have just really been a problem for defenses in this league over the last few years. We saw what Gronk was able to do. We've seen what Travis Kelsey's been able to do. Everyone wanted Darren Waller when he was leaving out. When you have a really good tight end that is multiple, meaning he can, you know, he can block when he needs to block. Um, he can block. I'm, I'm, for, I'm forgetting block George. I forget George Kittle. If you can find the proper ways to use him, he yeah. can't block when you line him up in front of a defensive end and say, hey, that's your guy. Right. right, right. He's not an in line blocker. Yeah, I mean, you can use him in motion and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. If you if you can get that done, I mean, Cooper Cup is out there blocking for the Rams on run play. So sure. if you can find interesting ways to get that done, it's good. There's no denying what he is as a pass catcher. There's no denying what he is as a mismatch for guys in the secondary. Corners not going to be big enough to handle it. Safety's not going to be quick enough to handle him. He's Travis Kelsey esque in the pass game and. I like the Raiders picking that because the Raiders are, you know, Antonio Pierce is already on record saying we're going to be a more physical football team. So rather than go doing what the Raiders do. You think this was Antonio Pierce driven? And the reason I'm asking that is, again, this seemed like one of those picks. The player, I like the player. It just seemed like so much. Um, we're physical. Uh, we're defense. We want that. No, just join it because last year they used the pick down as high end from Notre Dame. Mm. Perhaps, but. That was an Antonio Pierce, right? That's our thing. So you maybe yes, pick. maybe yes, it was. Yeah, you, you know, know in the past, yeah. you know who in the past who that pick would have been for the Raiders, right? Uh worthy for sure. Bo Nix, no, they're worthy for sure. The fastest right. guy in the draft is who we're going to get. And Antonio Pierce is coming and said, "We're going to be a little bit more of a physical football team. We're not going to go for the smaller guy far away from the." the field and we don't know what the quarterback situation is going to be long term there for the Raiders but when you have a pass catching tight end that is a quarterback's best friend so in the interim they may be taking your advice as you always say and I have to remind you of your own advice let's build up our defense right so so so, so you know they got Max Crosby they brought in the defensive tackle from the Dolphins following the name very good player Wilkins Wilkins very good player Yes. Here's the defensive guy. We get our, our pass catching tight end. We start to build the offensive line, and then we'll insert a quarterback. We're going to suck again because we don't have one this year, likely. Right. We like it, and we're going to be right there to I mean, get we, our could, we could maneuver our way in there and get the guy that we want. You know, yeah. if we can't get the guy that we want in this draft. Why go get someone that we're not sure about? Let's Let's go about setting the table. And look, picking a tight end, if that's your offensive pick, short of picking a tackle like what Jim Harbaugh did, um, also reaches and creates your identity. We're going to be physical, even on offense. So let me show you this. What was your – and I, not that you think the player won't be good, because we all do that, or we don't know if the guy will be good. But you're generally, where the person was picked and a team – and everything. What was your most troubling pick in the first round? I shudder to say this because they're so good at drafting and developing and doing their thing, but no one bats a thousand. My most concerning pick is Nate Wiggins going to the Baltimore Ravens. Just doesn't fit that profile there, okay? He's an undersized corner. Yes, he's a speed guy, but Amo, what's the AFC North? It's a physical division. One way or another, it's physical. It's black and blue. Remember how the NFC... I guess it was the, you know, the NFC North is called the black and blue. Right. Division. But I am now switching that over to the AFC North. The physical division is that one right there. The Ravens, the Steelers. Um, you've got the Browns. The Bengals, they all. And, and the Bengals, even though they throw the ball around with, uh, you know, with Joe Burrow, it's still a physical division. And I don't know that he really absolutely fits in that. And like, how are you going to use this guy? Don't and then, he's just seen dirt, like feel dirty. I don't mean to, in the back, like I'm dirty. Like you feel grit, like Steelers, Browns. There's no like you it see. It is. It's the old school football there. The um, Rust Belt. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so I don't know that this particular player fits into that. There are some other places I would have loved to have seen him go. You know, maybe maybe go to Los Angeles. Either one of those teams. 
or maybe go to Tampa or maybe maybe go to Carolina or Jacksonville. You know, right. Jacksonville was looking for money. Let me ask you this. Did you, the ratings typically, the risky and you, what I remember, always having kind of bigger corners. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just the, the yeah. idea of what I've seen. A six-foot, 200-plus pounder or someone at or around that, and it's just like smaller corners have not really worked out there, and I get it. This guy was the second fastest guy in all of the draft, ran a 4 two forty. That's exciting. How are you going to use that guy? And can you line him up in front of the type of receivers you're going to see most of the times in that division week after week? Is he going to, is he going to be able to handle a physical guy like George Pickens? Is he going to be able to handle a Jamar Chase or a T. Higgins if he's still on the Bengals? I don't know. I don't know if his skill set – really matches up week in, week out there. And then will he will he be healthy each and every week? And that's yeah. honest. If you if you're using your four two speed, usually that's a bad pay of that. I if feel you, you. yeah. You you're know, chasing somebody. I got to. Um I I understand that. I just yeah. I don't like the fit. We'll see. The Ravens are really good at developing guys and fitting them in. I'm just concerned that this might not be a hit for them. My, uh, you know, I I hesitate to say this. The easy answer would have been, I'm not going to use it as my answer. Bo Nix, does I think, because I don't want to get into the Richmond business. My gut tells me he was a guy a little too high there. Um, and I also think Sean Payton gets a little too much credit with developing quarterbacks because of Drew Brees. I think Drew Brees was probably going to be a Hall of Fame quarterback uh, on his own. Because mm. okay. he didn't do much of a Russell Wilson, and I see Russell Wilson win a double, play a couple of roles, and win one. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go for the easy answer. I'm going down at, uh, at 31. I didn't understand the receiver from Florida to the 49ers. I know they've got some uh, Pearsall, right? Was that yeah. Mm -hmm. Pearsall. I didn't understand. I know they've got some issues with contracts and they're two starters but they've got plenty of ass catchers of 49ers who at this point as long as they're not trading anyone which i don't think they will they've got plenty of receivers i, I didn't really think he was a first round talent i mean i watched a lot of college football i wasn't saying oh god you know we're looking for yourself so we get ready so i don't know the team did not that's all Tom, um, I'm going to agree with you there. And uh, the 49ers are another team that seems to draft well. So that was a head scratcher for me. And I agree with you. You've got George Kittle there who probably needs more targets. He definitely needed more in that Super Bowl. Um, you've got, you know, uh, McCaffrey out of the backfield. You've got Bebo and you've got IU for however long you've got that combination. So why are we adding another guy to it? A, a receiver's a, always a reach in the first round. And then you reached for a receiver. In this first round, you re reach for the position, you reach for the player. Uh, that was concerning for me. Going back to Bo Nix, though, I feel like Sean Payton saw this as being, if there's a guy that gives me any kind of Drew Brees vibes in this draft, it's this guy, Bo Nix. This looks like a guy that I could do what I did with Drew Brees with this guy. Now, Drew Brees has some characteristics there that probably can't really be duplicated. But I'm feeling like the way the game is played by Bo Nix, it's the closest thing to what Sean Payton has had success with in the past, and I think that's what he went for. I love, Emil, um, when, we're, when we're talking draft and quarterbacks, I love guys that have played and have made a lot of starts in college. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, listen, and I, I don't want to – I got out of that years, you know, you learn with experience, like, ah, oh, it's happening on – a pick because I don't think the guy's going to do anything. Understanding the limitations of what we talked about. This is a very inexact science. I can see all six quarterbacks being flops this year. Mm -hmm. I can see four or five of them being really good. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I need to. I need to be not middle, but I'm being honest with you. Who knows? We'll see how they use Bo Nix. We'll see how long Sean Payton is in Denver. Yeah. <laughs> On that note. Um, good segue into the next thing that we're going to talk about here is which one of those quarterbacks historically, and, we'll, and let's just go through the facts of what happened here. First three picks are quarterbacks. First four out of the first eight, four out of the first eight picks, quarterbacks. Five out of the first 10 picks, quarterbacks. Six 
out of the first 12 picks, which were all offensive too, by the way, were quarterbacks. Historically, only one of those first three guys are going to be worthy of where they were taken. And that's just what history has shown us. This is only the fourth, I think, or fifth time that this has happened. And in none of those previous times has more than one guy turned out to be the guy. So in your opinion, of those first three, let's just let's just start with that. Who do you think has the best opportunity to live up to where they were drafted? No process of elimination here. I've already talked about I'm dubious of Caleb in Chicago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And- the situation as you detail the leather, the whole thing. And I'm not a big Drake mean guy. I mean, mm. I, I see the towel that they, you know, the arm towel. I'm just not like, like, yeah, he might be. He is. I just, I don't, I'm not sure what Malingo is going to be after mm. the uh, check settle. For me, it's Daniels and Washington because the new owner, like, he just seven, he seems to run over as well. He seems to, you know, be a pretty decent owner who's coming in. But then again, the bar is not real high of Daniel Slayer, so. Right. Yeah. I mean, okay. anything is an upgrade after that. Uh, the GM seemed to have a little bit of a plan. They had got some talent around them all starting at Live and Cedar right now. The vision is tough, so they, they're, they're going to have to, you know, protect him those first couple of years that he did not let his confidence do room. But I think he's been coached well in college by a very underrated coach for some reason as far mm-hmm. as the college football fans that are on social media. It was the fake Cajun accent. So yeah, yeah. but Brian Tellings is a solid, really solid coach. So I, I think he has the best chance to succeed. Yeah, uh, I can't do anything but agree with you there. I talked about what's going on with Caleb. He doesn't have any excuses. They've done a good job setting the table there for him. But there's just the pressure of playing in Chicago. And then is the are the Chicago Bears going to totally change their historical identity and throw the ball around? Um, the way that they would need to for Caleb to actually be the quarterback that you drafted, the guy that you you pick there. Um, you can't. I, who who knows what is going to be done offensively in New England to say that Drake May is going to do anything? I'm not saying he won't. I'm not saying he will. We just don't know. There's just not enough there um, to 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 say with any you know confidence. Now, Jaden Daniels. Um, is going, at least in the intro here, going to be with a offensive coordinator in Cliff Kingsbury that's going to allow him to maximize his abilities. What it is you saw him do in college, I think he has a good chance of being um, at least asked to do when he comes in. So there's that comfortability. Remember that first year with RG3 where they ran an offense that suited him. So I think we're going to have that. And, you know, aside from all of the abilities that he has, the kid can throw, the kid can run. Um, I think that I, I'm, I'm big on fit. It looks like a really good fit there. And he does have those weapons to throw the football to. So he's, I, I'm not sure about their offensive line. Maybe you know a little bit more about well, that. Yeah, I, just think, I think, again, he's going to say, say most quarterbacks are good pick, let's be honest. They're going to bad teams, but. I think that, you know, both him and Williams are going into out of situations in that they're both in divisions like where the Lions and Packers are clearly above the Bears. Mm-hmm. The road trip to Minnesota is never easy for Williams. You got Daniels with the Eagles and Cowboys in his division, certainly, you know, above his team right now. So they're both in kind of like situation. But I guess that's, I'm saying something that's obvious because you're going to a bad team. So, sure, but I'm going to add this. Daniels is coming in with a coach. So unless something crazy happens on Steve Wilkes' situation, he's going to have that head coach probably through that first contract. Uh, I don't know what happens with an OC. Cliff Kingsbury is, yeah, who knows? But there'll be some continuity there. Yeah, I don't true. know what's going to happen in Chicago. If Chicago no. goes seven and ten again, or six and 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 what is it, eleven, five and twelve, that whole staff could be gone, and then it's what's coming in next for Caleb Williams, right? right. Um, and and what I said about New England still stays the same. So there's there's a fit for Jaden Daniels in Washington, and then there's a chance for some consistency and continuity there. Out of those first three guys, it just really looks like it sets up best for him. Oh, and by the way, he's extremely talented. You know what's fine before we get off the quarterbacks on the 
what what set up the NFL because of your rant a few weeks ago where the quarterbacks take is that the large chunk. Yes. Of the pie recycles through really a lot quicker. In other words, like in the old 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 days, even twenty years ago, a quarterback around his fifth or sixth year was really coming into himself. Yes. Right? And and then then you looked at it and to go like this, right? So you you took those first three to five four years, okay, you develop and then in year five, six, we start to really win big. That doesn't exist anymore because at year five and six is when you're gonna get a bag. So everybody wants well, to it's literally when you draft a guy of a, a box and it's ticking inside. Yes. It's, it's <laughs> literally it's what it is. is. It, and, and, and and year four, if you're not like really ascending, you're out. Like yeah. that comes. Just a few years ago, the court guy won a national championship at Alabama. But Gatrius draft him. He was the next Tom Brady. I don't even know what team is he at. Uh, where did he end up going? I don't know. I you don't know. Well, sure, that's what he's doing. Um, a guy that came in with him, Trey Lance. Gone. Cowboy. Back up. And, and you by know, the way, that, we could do a whole summer show. I'm still trying to figure out at this point. Because I think they had that quarterback, you know me. Yes. They won every year at trade him. Right. Yeah. What are they doing with him? Like, I mean, they use the four trial pick. Are they going to showcase him in the preseason and try to trade him? Seriously. What's the plan? I want, do, what's the pressure there? Do you need to do something with him? Well, they just declined his option, right? So right. next year he'll be a free agent. So what are his options? I guess. I think they'll get to re-sign him at the number that they want unless Trey's crazy and thinks he can go hop on yeah, somewhere. So maybe, maybe the plan is... We're going to develop this guy as an insurance policy. He plays the game as close to our yeah, starting that, that is hurt. Yeah. It's not a big change if we bring him in. Well, there's a guy, you what, what is he, 23, 24 years old? Right. You're going to write the guy off? He's barely playing any football. I mean, he's in backup purgatory, you know. He's gone to where Sam Darnold has gone to. Maybe he gets another chance like Darnold is getting, but those chances tend to be slim, you know. It's just so crazy how that happens. It's interesting, guy. by the way. If you really look at some of these guys, like they're just like Zach Wilson, God. I mean, you got all these guys. It's like four years. Is, it's like you said, they get a box, and at, at three, it's ticking. it's ticking. If year four, it's not you know going right there over there, like uh, cut the yellow wire or the red wire. Which what you know what I mean? It's just oh, uh, and fans are going to have to be used to because you know they've been very lucky these last three or four years. Their roster's been stacked. Well, wait till they see what happens because. Or at least you get a ton of money, or you know, because they don't have another option. Maybe that's why you got Parasol. Well, yes, I think I think Brandon I Brandon I hope so. I'm far all tired. He's going for agency. I've heard that he might be the one that they keep and let Debo ride. I don't know. Who knows? Well, who knows? We'll find out. Look, finally closing this thing out. We we do go to some college football. I told you the ninety eight percent NFL and the draft. Here's the two percent. Once again, Deion Sanders and the Colorado Buffs are all the talk of college football before we kick the season off. And the transfer portal has been a big thing. No one has pimped out the transfer portal more than Deion Sanders. Whether he's talking about it, getting guys on it, or sending his own guys into it, it has created a big buzz. And listen, I don't know if there are more haters for any other team right now than the Colorado Buffaloes. Come hell or high water, though, Amol. It is Deion Sanders working the Deion Sanders magic that we've always known him to do, which is I'm going to get you talking about my football team. You can love it, hate it, whatever. Just be talking about us. This is the most I've heard anyone talk about Colorado football since the Darian Hagen and J.J. Flanagan days um, of the 90s. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know if you've seen any uh, comments that have been made by both Dion. He's had some back and forth. I mean, I read that it was, it was a little some back and forth with players. It was a clear fight with a bunch of people out there. Some of them, most of them, he doesn't even know, nor should he care about. Uh, I guess, obviously, I'm a, you know, anybody who's listened to the show for a while knows I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a Dion fan because of what he played for. Him. And you know, I don't like Dion even before he played with Cowboys. He's got to, I think, separate Dion the player because once in a while he doesn't catch himself because mm. we all go back to, to to our major and sure, and, you know, you're, I think he's the coach now. 
And I'm not sure trash talking with fans on Twitter is really what we want to be doing. I use the analogy all the time. You know, uh, a fly lands on an elephant. The elephant does stampede because it is mine. It knows I'm an elephant hmm. and that's a fly. Right. Okay. So I think you got to kind of restrain yourself because you don't necessarily want to put a target on your team's back with other teams. Because first of all, they're not there yet. It's hmm. not enough. You know, they're... They're not that team. If Georgia sure. has a target on their back, does they win? Right. No, I agree. I agree with you there. Um, and listen, as a father of two young men that played college football and know the rabid nature of fans, especially now that we have social media, it is difficult to hear people disparaging your son um, on on social media. It's a difficult thing to walk away from. Um, I definitely had my battles with guys on Twitter. And then when it reached the crescendo, when Marco threw that shoe and it was just, I, it was that, then that I realized it's too many of these people. You're never really ever going to win. And then I don't know who I'm out here trading barbs with and giving importance to. This could be a guy underneath his mom's basement, not in the basement, right. underneath the mom's basement. What are they worth? On top of that, I'd had guys that I'd had verbal back and forths with that were Florida fans that were talking absolutely crazy, and they would see me in the stadium at games and be immediately friendly. So I'm like, this is all a show anyway. I'm with you, and I'm not Deion Sanders. Infinitely. Social media. I saw his one comment. He, he said, uh, he said, I have time today or something. At the end yeah, of now, I wish he didn't have the time. Yeah. Right? I, I, the information. I, I, Rise yeah. above it. You know, if your son wants to do that, he's a 20, 21-year-old. Let him do it. Shiloh has um, a funny personality. He's kind of like you in that sense. Let him do it. You are up here. You're Saban-esque. Uh, you will not see Nick Saban, Curry Smart, um, Ryan Day, Jim Harbaugh, going back and forth with anyone on Twitter. You just won't see it. No. They might go back and forth with a media member. Right. You know, but not with Joe Schmo on Twitter. I would love to see him divorce it's a himself. Hole. I think anybody who's old enough realizes as you get older. You, it's you never know, ending. Social media. You, yeah, you, it's it's pulling a toilet. Yeah. Well, it's just going to keep going on. You're never going to win. Someone else will take up the fight for that person. And then you'll have a mob there. It's like Walking Dead. If you ever watched that show. You'll blast one of those zombies. It'll be 700 of them coming. You're going to have to retreat. So in the end, they're going to win out. And Emil, I'm. you mentioned something about Target. It's not just other teams. When you get it to a certain level, now the officiating can get kind of funny because they personally don't like you. And if something happens, then administration that's got to you know, give a ruling on something that may have happened in the game. Maybe your player punched a player and you need a favor there, or you just need things to be fair and honest. And where it would have been a one or two game suspension, it's a three or four game. I'm just drawing up a scenario. Here's, here's what people don't realize, right? Do I think, because we're all human, we, we all have biases. And as you get more perspective, and you're, if you're smart, you try to control your biases as best you can, or at least be aware of them. Sure. But if you're officiating a football game, where I think it comes in is, I don't really think officials cheat. Oh, I think it is. Deion Sanders is 12 yards on to the field. Okay. I laid you. Hey, coach. Back up. That. Yeah. I don't like you by the letter of the law. Yeah, that flies 100 you. feet in the air. That's right. Because, yeah. again, I'm going to give you some latitude. My bias is, I like Chad Wolf. Good mm -hmm. guy. Chad, get back. You're on the field. I don't like to have oh, Of course. On the, and the everyday scenario that we can all identify with is you get pulled over and you're cool and courteous with the cop. You roll the windows down, whatever. Listen, I got you 55 and a 35 here. Or maybe not, 55 and a 40. Uh, I'm going to let you go with a warning. You know, they'll ask what's going on. Hey, I got to get to work. I'm late. Uh, I'm going to let you go with a warning. Just slow down next time, right? But if I'm MF this guy, refuse to roll the window down, don't follow. Oh, he's going to write you up for the ticket. That's a great example. There's Wolverines, right? They're just out there trying to do the job. I, I've had that happen in my life, touching the lowest stops on a couple of miles out years ago. Got back a long ago. You know what happened there? I said, Oh, yeah. I said, I, I said you know, Yeah, man, you I got said, me. It was top gun. I touched the go. 
Right. Exactly. Humor is usually best in that situation. Yes, yeah, right. he runs it. He knows everything in town. He says, hey, listen. That's a dangerous intercession. So he comes flying through there. You could have got killed. Do me a favor. Stop next time. Okay. Yeah, I would love That's to see. Yeah, I'd love to see Dion like go return to to dignity. This is dignified. I don't even have to answer that. That attack that you did. I don't even have to answer that. I'm you think he's there attack. before we? So, you think? Honestly, if you were guessing, because no one knows. Dion, yeah. Dion, keeps telling me guessing. Right. Do you think he'll stay there more than five years? History says no. Where has Dion ever stayed anywhere more than five years? He did with your Cowboys, but. Typically, no. Five in Atlanta, one in San Francisco. Um, he stayed with Dallas for however long. About five. It was right about five. Doesn't do more than five years anywhere. So, yes, who he is wears on people in terms of his confidence. So that brings the attacks. And he's getting them hot and heavy in year two. I could see him staying around year four or five. Hey, listen, that's enough. I don't need this. I Come think on. the entire thing for, for his lifestyle. It's just going to become more of a grind than, than he really wants. I think it's like any project when you start, it's fun because it's different. It's something mm -hmm. you hadn't really, you know, you get the Jackson State thing. I can walk and show people I can coach at the highest level. And I think after a while, it, the, the boosters and, and, you know, suck it up to people because the college wants to know me. <laughs> I think that's yeah. going to really... I didn't guess anything. Yeah, look, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and he's just never really stayed anywhere more than five years. So I'd be shocked if he did that. Yeah. Um, it would mean that he coached beyond his sons being there, so we can kill that noise. But him being there five, six, six seven, eight years, I don't think so anymore. Hey, that's it. I don't either. I agree with you. All right, that's it. That's going to put a wrap on this mostly draft show and a little bit of uh, college football and beyond. We always got to work some kind of transfer portal NIL in there at the end. But uh, we've gotten that done. And once again, though, if you've not subscribed, go ahead and hit the subscribe button here on YouTube or uh, whatever you are using to stream this podcast. We're looking forward to all of the off-season shows. Is all the, listen, we get provided with – there is no off-season anymore in football. Maybe we'll, we'll do some sure. off-season because we do get some – Decent gambling advice here. Ah. For, for, for entertainment only. Maybe one oh, it's investment summer. advice, yes. One of these summer shows, we will do early over-unders. Um, yeah, we might we, we, we might we might need to yeah. do that. Hell, Bovada is sponsoring this program right now. That's right. That's right. It'd be for the owls adjust. Because remember, when you have the least information, well, but you're here for you get information. You, you can, can get, get that odds. Yes, yes, absolutely. True. All right, that's going to put a wrap on this. We're out of here. We appreciate you guys joining us and watching us here on the show. For Amo Calamino, I'm Chad Wilson. Thanks for watching and listening to the Two Chubs Football Podcast. We'll see you guys next time.